Did you know that 27% of the population in the town of Hingham is aged 60 years of age and older? Did you know that that population will represent 50% of our census 10 years from now? This is one of the fastest growing demographics in the country. Every day, 10,000 citizens in the United States will turn age 60 until the year 2030. I sat down with Barbara Fonsworth, director of the Hingham Senior Center. She'll be retiring in a couple of months. We had a great conversation about her thoughts about how she feels of what's been accomplished thus far and the challenges that lie ahead for her successor. Words of advice from a marathoner. She still has one more good marathon left in her. Stay tuned. Barbara Fonsworth, Director of Elder Services here in the town of Hingham. Thank you for just sitting with me this afternoon and let's just talking about, you know, all things of uh, senior living, senior um, services, uh, challenges for our seniors, uh, and really the body of work that you feel most proud about. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself on a personal level. We were just chatting that you're a marathoner. Well, I would say a slow marathoner, but... Um. As long as you finish. <laughs> as long as you finish, you can officially say you're a marathoner, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you were telling me your first marathon was where? Honolulu. Wow, what was that like? It was fun. My, my intent had been, I, I did it with the Arthritis Foundation, and my intent had been to walk it and then because they, it was a very walker-friendly marathon. But in training with arthritis, we most of us learned that, yeah, we could run. Um, so we, we did that. Um, and I, I'll never forget at the end of the marathon when I finally caught back up with my husband, he said, I'm going to do that next year with you. I said, okay. So I rolled around and I said, gee, I think I might do that with um, arthritis again next year. How about you? Do you think we should start training? He goes, oh my God, that was the heat of the moment. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> so I, I, I've done nine. Um, nine. My last one was Chicago two years ago, um, which was interesting because I pulled a hamstring. I've never gotten injured. And I pulled that around mile eight or nine. So I walked the rest of it in which was actually kind of fun. Which of the marathons are you most proud of? Um, I think your first one, even though it's almost your slowest, it's like you, you can never really recapture that feeling again because it's like, well, I really did this. Um, and then um, my first Chicago in 2005, because that was my best time ever. Um, but they've all been fun in one way or another. It's a great way to see a city. Where are you originally from? I'm originally from a small town called Avon outside of Rochester, New York. So, yes, it snows there. And they probably got a lot right now. Right now, yes. And how did you end up here on the South Shore? When I got out of graduate school, um, I was looking for jobs. I was living home for the summer and just applying. That's back in the days when you went through the help wanteds. Yes. Um, so I just applied for anything that was social work, elder related. Um, ended up getting a job um, as a, what was called the support service coordinator for nutrition programs um, at West Suburban Elder Services. Um, so I stayed there till 1985. Um, and then I lived in Marshfield, so I was commuting back and forth to Watertown. And they had just created a new position um, for their Council on Aging Senior Center Director. So I applied for that and got that. Um, 
Why elder services as opposed to um, early childhood education or healthy mothers or whatever? You know, it's, it's interesting. I, when I originally went to college, I wanted to be a history and French teacher. Um, and then came into contact with a group of um, Native Americans from Canada um, and was just so impressed with the work they were doing with their elders and decided to pursue a career in social work. Um, and I did my placements in gerontology. Um, it's just, I just liked the population. I just thought that older adults had a lot to offer. Um, my undergraduate placements were in long-term care, which is, you know, there's a place for long-term care. Um, I have a great deal of respect for it, but realized that that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and when I went to graduate school, I had the opportunity to do placements in senior centers and um, community agencies dealing with older adults, so. You know, when we talk about senior centers, and um, I'm not suggesting that perhaps it's the popular point mm -hmm. of view, but some of us, and I include myself, we have this impression of what a senior center is like, um, where everyone just sort of sits around and either they're watching television, they're reading the newspaper, or they're playing mahjong or, or, or dominoes or something. But what else really goes on in the senior center? I think the senior center, um, and we've all changed and grown up a lot over the years, is really a, a focal point um, in the community. I, I kind of look at it as, it's a community center. Um, if people could just get through that word senior. Yes. Um, and our, our basic goal and mission is to really keep, help people stay engaged in the community. Because um, I think oftentimes you retire um, and you focus so much on family and career that now what do I do with all this spare time? Um, and through the senior center people have opportunities they can they can volunteer they can stay, keep engaged in the community um, they can um, stay fit we do a lot of fitness classes um, we do a lot of lifelong learning um, as well as on the flip side um, there are people who really struggle financially um, who really need some assistance with um, benefits applications, um, who need some in-home help that we can help them access those resources. So it, it, it's a wide range. I, we, it's interesting because our spectrum of ages is 60 on up. So we could have in any one day a, a wide range of, of a 40 year span of people um, in here. Um, we can have mothers and daughters. Even mothers and daughters. daughters and wow. fathers and sons. <laughs> and fathers and sons. There was a recent article, recent, I think back in November, in USA Today. Uh, they had done an expose on um, elder abuse and elder neglect. But what I found most fascinating in this particular piece was it spoke about self-neglect, that what we have, it's, it's almost like a silent, dirty little secret where um, statistically speaking, every day, perhaps until 2030, 10,000 citizens in the United States turn age 60 every day. So this is the boomers that are all now coming of age vis-a-vis -vis 60 and, and plus, many of whom are empty nesters, uh, many of whom are on the margins. And what's starting to manifest is this self-neglect. And I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And, and do you see that as something that is occurring right even in, in our own community here in Hingham? Self-neglect is. I, it's actually falls under the um, purview of protective services, um, along with um, you know, financial and physical elder abuse. Self-neglect is, is one of the categories that, that fall there. Um, I think what really presents itself as the most difficult with self-neglect is um, number one, identifying who actually is someone who is in the process of self-neglect, and number two, 
trying to work with an individual who basically has capacity. They're of sound mind, um, they have the right to self-determination, um, and trying to get them to understand that there's some issues here. Um, and I think in, in some of the cases, because I think our mental health system um, needs some work for, for older adults, there, there are some mental health issues there and trying to identify those, particularly around depression, um, anxiety, and, and sometimes it could even be medication. Um, that um, they're, they're not, the side effects where they're not taking their medications as prescribed. Um, so it does occur. I mean, it's, um, I think for those of us in the field, one of the, the champion causes was that it was, it's now recognized as a form of abuse, self-abuse. Looking back over your career, what are you most proud of, your accomplishment? And what kind of legacy would you like people to remember you? I, I think on? probably both here and, and when I was in Marshfield, I think just bringing, in Marshfield it was brand new, it was startup. Um, so just bringing that program to a point um, where the recognition was that a larger physical plant facility was needed, um, that we were really working to identify the needs in the community and provide programs and services. Um, in, in Hingham, I think that there was a great foundation when I came, um, just sort of growing the program along the way. Um, you know, kind of, you know, a lot of programs that we had when we started, when I started here are no longer in existence. There's no longer a need for um, some of those, and we've kind of tried to adapt our program um, and keep it fresh. You know, we, we've added, you know, I, I laugh because a couple of years ago I thought maybe we should start ukulele lessons, and the staff kind of looked at me like, are you serious? I said, well, let's try it, and I, the program is really um, blossomed. Um, ukulele. Ukulele. Of, of all instruments. Uh, of all instruments. I guess it's easy to play and okay. easy to pick up. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing that I'm, I'm very proud of here um, is the staff and, and, and the volunteers. Um, they're an incredible, dedicated group of people um, who never hesitate to do what's asked of them, um, who aren't afraid to speak an opinion. Um, and I think that, that says a lot for um, myself and the leadership of the, of the town that, you know, to enable people to do that. Um, and then, of course, we are a nationally accredited senior center, so that, um, I think that's a, a proud moment for Hingham. Looking forward, what do you see are the challenges, and what advice would you want to leave for your successor? Um, seniors will tell you it's parking. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I think that the challenges for um, the senior center itself are, are really the physical space, the plant. Um, we've outgrown this space. Um, I think it's, it's, it's recognized um, and it's where do we go from here? Um, a design that's going to meet the, the current population as well as the growing population. Um, the 60 and older population of Hingham is now 20% of the town, 27%, excuse me. So um, that's huge, um, and it's projected to be close to 50% um, by 2030, 2032. Um, and I, I think the other challenges really will be um, growing a senior center and, and keeping it um, moving and fresh and, and going forward and, and looking at um, one of the challenges we face now is I think we need to really start looking at um, dementia and dementia-friendly programs um, f to enable people to stay in the community for as long as possible, um, all forms of dementia. It's interesting um, because when you talk about uh, dementia and all the various forms of dementia up to and including mm -hmm. presumably Alzheimer's, um, when we look at a new facility or a new design for that, what does that really look like for that particular subgroup? One of the things that I've, I've talked a lot with, um, with, with the council is that they, we may want to look at, rather than um, a program for people mid to late stages of dementia, um, a program for newly diagnosed 
um, so that when you have that initial diagnosis, of course there's a dement a, an adjustment period. Um, there are things that you can do within that program to really help people adjust and adapt um, as well as their families. So um, that's one of the things I think we should really look at and focus on. I uh, heard about a program somewhat cutting edge that incorporates technology to extend the reach of the senior center for those who insist on um, aging in place mm -hmm. at home, um, are reluctant to leave the home, and yet how do you bring services to them vis-a-vis -vis technology, whether it's virtual, FaceTime type of, mm -hmm. of interactions, and other video-based monitoring. What are your thoughts about that? I think there's pros and cons. I think, um, I think it's a way to introduce um, available resources and to get people thinking about what they could possibly do um, and how they can stay engaged. Um, but on the flip side, I sometimes wonder if it's keeping people isolated. Um, I, I'm still a firm believer that there's nothing like actual human contact. Um, and I, I struggle with this with, um, you know, webinars and things like that. It's, it's, I still struggle with, you need the human contact. Especially when you're, you're getting older, you live alone and there's the isolation that's already setting in place. It makes I mean, sense. Because when I look at the senior center, I look at, I'll, I'll take some of our fitness classes, for example. You know, a lot of these people came because their primary goal was they wanted to either stay in shape or get back in shape. And the end result was they have developed so many new friendships. Um, you know, a lot of their friends may have passed, their spouses have passed, they've retired, so they've lost that whole group of friends. And, and through the senior center and that human contact, um, they now have a lot of new friends that they do things with on weekends, evenings, you know, after a class. Um, and I think human contact extends longevity and your quality of life. Let's talk a little bit about some of the abuses that we know are occurring out there with our seniors. You know, there are the obvious physical abuse, emotional abuse, but there's now this I mean, perhaps it's always been there, but it's certainly gotten a lot more sophisticated, which is financial abuse. And I believe it was uh, perhaps dating back as early as 1998, where they amended um, what was then known as the um, uh, Elder Abuse and Dependent Adult Civil Protection Act, which then created a program called FAST, F-A-S-T, financial abuse specialist teams. Um, these are teams made up of law enforcement, made up of financial specialists, made up of social workers and others who all work collaboratively um, to come to the aid of um, those seniors who are being abused, mm -hmm. not necessarily by family members or individual friends, but by financial institutions. Mm -hmm. You're nodding. Yeah. Tell me more, why do you Well, I, I mean, I think I've seen some cases um, around the state where um, a financial advisor, for example, took advantage of an older adult, um, had the person write some checks to um, donate to a higher education institution or set up a different type of trust. Um, I think there was a case in Duxbury several years ago. Um, I, I think oftentimes you, you have this trust in somebody and so you think that you're doing the right thing and you end up losing a lot of money. And in some cases I've seen people lose their, their fortunes um, or what they have amassed for retirement. Um, and it's, it, it's I think for somebody in that position, more often than not, it's very difficult to admit that yes. you've been taken advantage of, so you're reluctant to come forward. It's, it's an embarrassment thing when really it shouldn't be. Um, 
because people are good at what they do to scam people. Um, you know, I look at all the um, things in the Hingham police blog that they get. You know, I, there must be a scam a week where someone in town has gotten that phone call from the um, grandson in jail, don't tell your mother, um, or I need to fix your computer. As we always say to people, do not give out any information. As, as often as you say that, it still happens. Um, we actually, uh, someone who was very um, alert, oriented, um, just wrote an article for us she had gotten taken advantage of. And she said the hardest thing for her to admit in the beginning was that it happened. She said, but once I got through that embarrassment, um, then it was reported to the police. But by that time, I mean, she can't get her money back. Um, but I, I think people just really need to, I don't answer the phone, so that's my recommendation. You don't recognize that phone mm -hmm. number, don't answer the phone. Except that we, we, we have uh, these scam artists, mm -hmm. telemarketers who have, they've gotten so creative yeah. up to and including your phone will ring, let's say on your mobile, you look down and it's your phone number. At least that's, they're leading you to believe and it's like, how could that possibly be? And they're just figuring out any which way to try to get through to you. And I feel bad for many of our seniors who just don't have perhaps the background uh, in managing you know, their technology to filter out block spam calls, for example. Or there could be diminished capacity. Uh, yes. And you know they're they're not they're just happy to talk to somebody and oh okay I'll give you some money and mm -hmm. before you know it you know five thousand ten thousand twenty thousand dollars is gone. That's that's just so unfortunate. We, we actually um, tried very hard to do a lot of education um, this year, particularly around the issuance of new Medicare cards, um, because everybody got a new Medicare card. Um, without their social security number and just really caution people as often as we could. If, if you get a phone call and it's about your Medicare card, just hang up, they're getting mailed. You, if you don't get your card, then you make that call. So in other words, we shouldn't be receiving phone calls from Medicare about our card. That should not be occurring. That should not be occurring. Just like the IRS doesn't call, call. you. <laughs> and say, I'm gonna come and arrest you. Right, right, that doesn't happen. <laughs> don't take the call, don't take the call. Pressing goals, needs uh, that you'd like to make sure that we've covered it. With, I think that one of the things that we, we need to focus on um, is we need to relook at transportation. Um, I think we do a pretty good job with the Monday through Friday, nine to five kind of thing, but we need to look at, at other options for evenings, weekends, um, and, and how do we do that in a manner that older adults trust. Um, you know, a lot of people, um, as good as Uber can be, they're also very reluctant to have to have an account. Um, there are some ways around that now, but it's still, how do you do it in a manner that makes people feel safe? Um, and I think we also need to look at our transportation system in terms of right now we do, okay, so you wanna go shopping Wednesday, we need to know by noon on Tuesday. How can we do more of a demand response? Um, because let's face it, if I run out of milk on Monday, I don't wanna wait till Wednesday. Um, so I, I think we need to kind of look at um, how do you adapt to society's needs right now around transportation? Um, particularly in a, a community like Hingham, there's not a lot of public transportation. We have the bus that goes through here a couple of times a day, and but doesn't really do door-to-door -door pickups. Um, I think that's a real pressing need. Um, and I think just um, the, the other pressing need is, is affordable housing for older adults. Um, probably, um, I would say 50% of the phone calls that our outreach worker, Kathy Glenzel, receives is around housing. Um, people no longer can afford their home. Um, they want to stay in Hingham, but there's really no place for them to go because there's waiting lists at, at Thaxter Park and at um, Lincoln School Apartments. Um, in some cases, um, 
and they may not want that kind of a, a environment, but they want to rent in a community of mixed ages, but the rents are such that they really can't afford that either. So it's housing is a big need. Um, Barbara, when is your official date of retirement? Uh, March 29th. My goodness, that's only a couple of months away. Um, has the process of uh, finding your successor started, and what does that process look like? Okay, the, the process actually, the, the posting was done this week. Um, applicant, applications are due by the 31st of um, January, um, and then the, the resumes will be screened. Um, and hopefully interviews will be conducted, um, first interviews between the first and second week of February, then second interviews, and then hopefully have somebody on board at least so they can have a week crossover with me. Um, I think if it's someone who's currently um, within the Council on Aging Senior Center network, um, it should be a fairly easy transition for them, at least in terms of senior center operations, and probably the most important knowledge is how does Hingham work? because um, as we know, every community is different. Um, so that's kind of the plan for the process right now, um, and I think it should probably happen in that, that time frame. And speaking of process, you're one of several town officials who are retiring uh, this, this current fiscal year here. Um, what's the overall atmosphere uh, within town hall of all of these uh, uh, officials going out at this around the same time. Well, I, I think Hingham's probably not unique in that respect, um, but I think it's it's kind of it, it's a lot of transition. Um, you know, I think for um, the town administrator being brand new, um, it's also an opportunity for him to look at his team and what is he looking for in that team. Um, because because of the, the retirements, that that's an opportunity, as well as I, I know how much he regrets losing a lot of, of us. Um, but I don't think it's, it's a lot of institutional knowledge. Yes. Um, I think it, that, that ends up going with people who have been in positions for a very long time. I mean, I look at my colleagues, um, we kind of, we laugh, we kind of got out of college together, grew up together, people had families, deaths of parents, and we've had a 50% turnover in the um, Council on Aging Director Senior Center Network in the last five years. Yeah. Huge. That is a huge Because turnover. everybody is at retirement age. Yes. So what exactly do you plan to do in retirement? Is it well, okay to ask Well, we're moving to Hilton question? Head on April 2nd. Hot dog. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, That's a golf community. Up, I don't golf, others. but. <laughs> okay, yes. Yes. Um, it's a beach community too. That's too. Um, and Are you excited I, about that? I'm yes. Um, I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do. Um, my husband's going to continue to work remotely part time, um, and I'm kind of just going to get the lay of the land down there. Um, I'm very impressed with their town government, so I may try and volunteer to sit on a board. Um, I kid around and say I'm going to go give their senior center director a hard time. <laughs> Or maybe I'll volunteer, um, but I haven't quite decided um, what I'll do. I know I do not want to have a, at least for the first year, a, a stringent commitment to anything. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, at least you won't have to worry about shoveling snow. And... Well, every 20 years or so. <laughs> they had two inches last year, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's the lay of the land. Awesome. Um, Barbara, I want to thank you for sitting with me and sharing your thoughts, your reflections uh, with us here on Harbor Interests. Um, it goes without saying, even though we hate to see you go, we congratulate you, you on your approaching retirement. You have much to feel and be proud of. And uh, you think you're going to continue to marathon or even if you're walking it? Well, I don't know if I can do another one. You know, you always say, I don't think I can do another one. And that's like, well, maybe one more. Um, we'll see. It's always good to have that attitude yeah, anyway. Yeah. Maybe one more. Maybe one more. Yeah. What's the one that I haven't done that I really want to do? Yeah. Very good. London. Oh, <laughs> hello. That'd be fun. Yeah.